announced next week. So next week we have the Sustainable Energy Challenge by George Crabtree, Margot National Labs, and uh, it should be a good talk on how we get a, a more sustainable situation when our current dependence on oil and fossil fuels. So it should be a great lecture. This week, though, we're glad to have Luke Sivarajan. So Luke got a PhD at MIT, went to Intel, and Okay, did the Intel first, then MIT. Okay, I was going to say, because <laughs> he says he worked on the, on the Pentium 4. That was a long time ago. Yeah. I don't think we had any of those left. So I, was, I hadn't quite figured out how that went. Yeah. So, uh, but we're glad to have him as a professor at UCSB. And uh, uh, actually, I can't even properly announce it. So you just won this big award, the first NIH award, but I don't know the name of it. Oh, it? New Innovator Award. So uh, it's the first one on the campus. So uh, that's pretty exciting. And the fact that NIH came in electrical engineering of all things is really pretty surprising. So uh, much less college engineering. So, so Luke's talk today is very broad, not just doing uh, that sort of work. Is what can electronic photonic co-integration do for energy efficiency? Thanks, John. So today I will try to give you a rough idea about what I think electronics can do for energy efficiency by close integration with photonics. And as you can see, my student Louise actually helped me out quite a bit. He's right there. And I wouldn't have been able to put this talk together if not for his help. So first we'll sort of understand why, what is it that electronics can actually do. We'll talk a little bit about the system that we're trying to build. So John and I work very closely on this. And we'll discuss a little bit, for those of you who are interested in the more nitty gritty details, I'll give you a little bit of the circuit details. And then we'll go on to wafer scale integration. This is sort of the way we think that we can get electronics and photonics put together in a very tight uh, platform so that it can actually bring the vision of an electronic photonic integrated circuit to bear. I'll talk a little bit about what we're planning to do in the future. So why is this an important problem? So data traffic is continuing to grow pretty much every year. And data centers are actually the key drivers of this. And if you look at the, the way as the years progress, the kind of traffic and how it increases, you see that mobile data pretty much drives all the traffic. And this should be very familiar because every five minutes, everybody takes out their phone and like clicks and tries to figure out who, the email. And we can't live without these kinds of things. If you look at the relative energy consumption, you see that the maximum growth actually is in the data center. So this is actually starting to become a problem. So let's sort of compare the carbon dioxide emissions worldwide by industry. So if you look at data centers 0.2, airlines is about 0.6. So you're pretty close to the airline industry, which is a pretty large industry worldwide. And data centers are not really worldwide. So. So this is actually a significant number. And as you keep going up, I mean, steel plants take the most energy. If you go by country, a data center is fairly close to a single country's carbon emissions. And that is in 2007. And in 2020, it's expected to outgrow pretty much all these three countries. That's a pretty significant uh, amount of uh, carbon emissions. So where does the power actually go? So you have computing demand, which takes about 52% of the power. And then you have the support, the supply. You waste about 48% of your power dissipation is right there. So you have cooling, you have power delivery, lighting, et cetera. Out of this, your computing takes about 588 kilowatts out of the 1,000. So it's about 50% is pretty much in computing. So whatever we can do to reduce this, this computing fraction is going to go a long way in, in getting the energy demand down. There's something called a cascade effect. So if you actually save a watt at the server, that means your DC-DC converter has to supply one watt less, which, you, which means you get a 180 milliwatt saving, which you go to your AC-DC converter. And you keep transforming back to the main transformer, you save about 2.84 watts for every watt that you save at the server component, which is, again, a very good reason why we should spend some effort in trying to figure out how to bring this power number down. There is another problem apart from power. It's demand. So if you look at the demand for, for internet data centers, it's basically outpacing the capacity by more than a factor of 10x. This is where we are. This is where the demand is. So this is sort of the gap between where we are and where we need to be. So it's not just power. It's also performance. Right? So we need to do both at the same time. 
So this was a study done by the DOE. And if you look at all the different technical opportunities, an all optical network basically can save you quite a bit of power, about 70%. So there are very big opportunities for us to actually do things in optical interconnect and optical uh, sort of networking. But why is it traditionally been an electronic switching platform? Mainly because it's, it gives you the opportunity of doing full uh, IP routing. It has enhanced security. You can put a lot of security bits in. You can scale it by parallelism. You can have a bunch of boxes, and that's how you get your, your bandwidth up. So your Cisco router at 4.48 terabits takes up, gives you a power dissipation about 10 kilowatts. Sure, you can scale it to 322 terabytes per second, but you will need about 700 kilowatts, which basically means you need your own personal power stain, which most people are not willing to do. It's, it's sort of not going to scale as the demand goes up, and therefore this is not really a viable option. So why does that actually happen? So CMOS scaling, which generally is supposed to follow a linear trend, doesn't scale linearly because of all the material problems that people have. You have breakdown voltages that you don't get to meet. So you have to end up doing a quasi-scaling. And you end up with a lot of leakage issues. So you can't scale your VT that fast. And all of these issues actually couple together. And you actually don't get as fast with every generation. So if you look at Moore's law, which actually is more of a density sort of scaling than a performance scaling, you see that it was we were pretty much following the performance density curve until about 130 nanometers. So you st at about 90 nanometers, you no longer start to follow this law because there are two things. One is leakage, and the other is interconnect. Your interconnects don't scale the same way that your transistor does. And so you end up spending a lot of power and a lot of performance in just charging up your wires and things like that. So here is the other problem. If you look at a electrical versus optical interconnect, the number of pins that you would need if you went to a 100 gigabit per second 64 port network is 5,000 pins. Now, if you look at the ITRS roadmap, which is a semiconductor roadmap, which predicts this sort of 10 years out, what is going to be the trend and what is the maximum, these are all out of the roadmap. You cannot put this many pins into your system. And that is a big problem. So you can't actually solve the problem this way. So one thing you could do is to go to a faster data rate and sort of go down to a less number of pins. So you get your aggregate bandwidth up by just by increasing the bandwidth per line. But again, right up here, you start hitting your roadmap. I mean, you're, you're the limit of your roadmap. Optical interconnects, the bandwidth scales freely. I mean, it, it's, you don't have that much of a penalty when you need to scale the bandwidth, because you can basically put a large amount of bandwidth on, on, on a single wavelength. So by scaling, by doing wave, wave division multiplexing, you can actually increase your, your throughput and not increase your power by that much. But you sort of have 128 fibers, which is doable. So what are we trying to do? So before I came to UCSB, I, I had no idea that you could do these kinds of things. And then I met John, and he was like, oh, we can do this, this, and that, and that, this, and this. And I was like, OK. So, what is it that me as a sort of a CMOS sort of circuit person can do for, for, for photonics and how do we bring it together and actually make something useful? So we, we realize that electronic switches are pretty difficult to scale because of the power constraint. So how do we use optical switching to solve the problem? Right now, I mean, there are optical switches that work on MEMS, mirrors, and things like that, but they're very slow. The other option you have is to use semiconductor optical amplifiers, which, again, you can do, but it will dissipate a lot of power. So what we would like to do is basically build a very highly integrated CMOS electronic circuit with a hybrid silicon photonic switch that basically will solve both the capacity and the power problems that, that we were just talking about. So what do we want to do? So this is all like work in progress, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. So what we want to do is basically develop area efficient low power circuitry that can actually drive the switch so that you can actually send data where you want to send it. We want to develop new types of circuits to be able to sense the optical data coming in so that it's very high fidelity and very robust. And we want to basically have a multi-channel front end. The other things we want to do is basically have out power equalization, have feedback in such a way that even if you have a lot of 
losses in your switches or if you have variation per port, you can actually compensate for it by using smart electronics. The nice thing about electronics is that you can build a lot of smarts into it, right, which can aid the photonics into actually developing a more robust solution. So that's sort of the idea behind what we want to do. So what we basically want to do is we want to put a, a CMOS chip in very close proximity to a optical switching network and basically use the CMOS electronics to do both control and also be able to, to do some sort of feedback and regulate the system in such a way that you get the best performance out. So here is sort of a cartoon image of a processor and a uh, switch, and this was an image done by Mark Tan, who's, who's right there. And this is a this is configured right now as a Banish network for those of you who are interested in, in, in networking. So here is our system architecture. So you get basically a two and a half gigabit optical packet header, which gets read by the trans impedance amplifier. So you basically convert this by using a photodiode. You get your data and you, you basically bring it to digital levels by using a limiting amp. And then you do your data recovery, which is basically a clock and data recovery on the spot. And we basically right now, because we want to limit the amount of design we do in the university level, we want to put all the processing that we need to do, which is easier to do on an FPGA outside of custom design circuitry. So we do our configuration logic, which is done in an FPGA. So what will happen is you will get a request from a sender. You will decode the packet. You basically will set, tell your FPGA to configure the switch fabric in a particular fashion so that you can route the data from here to here, for example. So that's sort of the idea. And you have both switch drivers and gain control on the altar. I will tell you what these are for. And you also have a photo detector right at the output, which is, again, sensed by a low frequency TIA, which is a trans impedance amplifier, which converts the current into voltage. And then you basically go to a lookup table so that if there is a power difference between what you wanted and what you, ex what, what you needed and what you, what you got, you actually you set it up correctly. So what we do is we first go through a calibration phase where you basically route data from here to here, here to there, and try to find all the losses in the network, and then store the appropriate gain control in the FPGA, and then whenever you get a particular request, you know what you need to do in order to set up the network correctly to equalize the power in the system. So there's Luis. So, <laughs> so he did all the circuits here. So we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, auto switch driver and the TIA and the integrated optical front end. I won't talk about the clock and data recovery uh, as of now. So the optical switch that we're using is from Professor Bowers' group, and it was done by Huawei Chen. And it's basically a Mark Zender switch. And it works on, you can basically model it as two reverse bias diodes in depletion mode, which basically change the carrier density, which changes the refractive index in the Mark Zender. So if you look at the characteristics of the, of the switch, so if, you, if here you see you can go from port 1 to port 3, you can go from port 1 to port 4, or you can go from 2 to 3 or 2 to 4. So those are your different options, right? And you see that when you need to go from 1 to 3, you have to basically bias it at about 4.5. And if you need to go from 2 to 3, you need to bias it at slightly lower. Uh, 2 to 4, you need to bias it slightly lower than that. So the point of showing you this piece of data is to tell you that you can't just have one driver with one power supply and be just OK with it, because the switch needs to be readjusted to work at its optimal level in order for you to get the performance you want. And each switch needs to have its own level. So you need to, you need to think about how to do that as well. So what we did was we actually took a driver, which is an inverter, and we basically changed its power supply. So depending on what voltage you want to drive the, the Mark Zender switch, you change the power supply so that when you switch the inverter, it only goes up to that power level. The advantage of this is that you basically have a, a local circuit that is isolated from the power supply, so you don't have power supply variations. And this is an important thing when you need to have robust sort of communication uh, in the system. And we only consume about 150 microwatts in this, which is 
fairly low and one of the things I should point out one of the reasons why this, this power is low is because the switch is capacitive in nature and for that we will have to thank Professor Bowers. So it is because of the fact that you have a capacitive switch and not a switch that requires constant current injection that you actually end up with a lower power dissipation. So here is the sort of the architecture. Like I said, it's basically a, you have basically a regulator, a supply regulator and that regulates the power to the, to the inverter. If you set your reference voltage for your switch, it will basically put out that particular square wave. And as you see, it's pretty small in its, in its area. So we can make many of these things in a very, very small and compact area. And that's one of the things that is very useful about electronics is that electronics in general can occupy a very small area Whereas photonics, the scale is different because the way the wavelength scales, you cannot scale it much smaller than a certain area. But this is where you can put a lot of electronic smarts into a photonic circuit and actually help the photonics quite a bit. So this is basically show you that in order to get this fast rise time, what we basically do is in order to save power, we basically go through a turbo boost in the beginning and just jack up the current in the beginning and then release it so that we don't spend and dissipate all the power all the time. So that's the simulation that basically shows you that in the beginning, as soon as the bit comes in, we set up a turbo voltage, which pumps in a lot of current, gets the ramp up very, very fast, and then we slow it down so that we don't dissipate power. The other important thing, what we, what we wanted to solve was to actually create a new type of transit impedance amplifier that is truly differential. And why we wanted to do it truly differential is because if you have a fully differential circuit, you get very low noise, you get much better noise immunity because you're rejecting all the common mode noise. And we looked at the literature and we saw that most people, by the way they do it, is pretty much single-ended. And we wanted to see if we could do it better. So we had come up with this architecture where we have a photodiode here, which receives the, the data. And by doing a single to bidirectional current conveyor sort of topology, where what ends up happening is if current goes into this node, this will basically be active. But if it goes out of this node, it is actually going to be conveyed by that transistor. So you can actually do sort of this push-pull dance and sort of get a differential voltage. The other thing we also do is we do a self-regulated DC cancellation. So we, here we have a low-pass filter. So at a certain frequency, what's going to happen is this will look like almost like a diode-connected device. And that will basically kill the gain of the entire circuit. So you actually get DC cancellation at the same time that you get your differential. And then this basically does the appropriate subtraction to actually get you what you want. So again, you see that the area is very small. It's only 150 microns by 73 microns for the TIA. So you can have lots of these. And it has about 1.7 gigahertz of bandwidth, which is slightly lower than what we want right now. So we are working on the next iteration to actually get it to 2.5 gigahertz. And here is the I that we get from this particular TIA. Like I said, it's fully differential, nicely centered. You get a very nice eye opening uh, from the TIA. The other nice thing about this particular TIA is that compared to a, this is a classical regulated gate cathode TIA, the power supply rejection ratio is only good to about a few megahertz. We are good to about a few gigahertz. So this is actually very important because now you can actually build circuits that actually have a varying power supply or have power supply noise, which is going to be present no matter what you do, and you're robust to it, and that's very important. And this is the total integrated noise of the circuit. So if you go from, uh, from a, a few megahertz to a few gigahertz, you get about, you have 50 picoampere per root hertz to 168 picoampere per root hertz. So if you integrate the whole thing, I think it comes up to about five microamps on the total. The next thing is basically we have a limiting amplifier that basically brings everything up to, to full well. And we use the classical uh, Cherry Hooper stage. It's just a very fancy name for saying that if you want to increase the bandwidth of an amplifier, you have to have a very low gain. So you basically put some feedback around it and kill the gain a little bit. That's really what a Cherry Hooper does. And again, here is the layout of a very of the cherry hoop, of the limiting amplifier cherry Hooper stage. And again, this is very small, 330 by 100. So we have 50 ohm driver on this particular chip just for observing it on a scope and things like that. But you don't need it if you're actually diving an optical switch, because optical switches are capacitively loaded, and if they're closely integrated, then you don't get the reflections. You don't get into these problems, which is the other important piece of having it integrated. 
So here is the full eye of the, of, the, of the circuit, and you can see that you have a pretty good eye opening with a few hundred millimoles. So here we did a simulation of what data we sent in and what data we got out, and as you can see, we pretty much recover exactly what we sent in. This is all simulation, of course. Now what happens when we get the chip back? So in order to test this thing, we used basically a on wafer for probe testing method, and basically we did both the trans impedance and the supply rejection, and this is the way we, we did the testing. So as you can see, the measured and the observed parameters are pretty good. I mean, we get pretty much what we expected. We get the bandwidth that we, this is a 130 nanometer IBM process. So, and here there is some discrepancy on the S33, and we're still figuring, trying to figure out what, what, the, what the reason for that is. So we, we get a transient gain of about 57 dB ohm, which is sort of what we wanted and what we expected. And as you see, this is our measured, I mean, this is our uh, simulated, the dotted line, and the measured is pretty close to what one would expect. So the group delay, if you look at it, it seems that the group delay goes up at lower frequency. And the reason for this is this particular TIA was not configured as a burst mode TIA. And for those of you who don't, are not very network sort of savvy, I guess, I was until my students are working on it, so. So the way this burst mode works is, so instead, of, if you're generally communicating on a line, you, you assume that there's always data, right? But if, if you don't have data, let's just say the data dies in the middle and it's just you're quiet for some time. Your circuits generally don't know what to do because you're relying on incoming data to figure out where your DC was and things like that. So if you don't design the circuit correctly to actually reconfigure itself very, very fast as the data comes in, which is normally what happens in internet traffic. You send a packet of data and then you don't send anything. You send another packet and don't send anything. So it's called burst mode communication. So if you want to do burst mode communication, you actually have to fix this problem. And that's sort of what we're doing right now, is to actually make sure that we don't get large group delays for various low frequencies. And like I said, the supply rejection in our, de in our design is very good and it's up to a few gigahertz. And that was our simulated, and that's our measured this is actually an instrument, measuring instrument limitation, not really the in limitation of the circuit. So this is the total integrated noise. Like I said, the total noise is 5.2 microamps, and we are expecting about 10 microamps from the photo detector, so therefore we will be okay because our signal to noise is about two to one. So the reason why we are getting less than ideal measurement is because I think that we have some path that couples back through the power supply, and that's something that we are trying to fix right now. And this is the switch driver, the one that had the, the power supply regulated switch. And this is what we measured, and that's what we simulated for the rice time, how fast it actually goes. And it, it is pretty good and pretty accurate to what we expected. And so what we did was we took the CMOS driver circuitry and we took a hybrid silicon switch that was there in, in John's lab, and then we, we basically made sure that we could actually drive the switch with our driver and see if the optical response is actually where we wanted it to be, whether it rises as fast as we expected it to, and it does. So, so far we've been fairly successful at this and we wanna make the next iteration and move forward and actually get it to where it's, 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 it, it works exactly the way we want it to work. So what do we win by doing all this stuff? So if you take our current design and sort of scale it from 236, and the reason why we chose 36 was because the current commercial Mellanox switch is a 36 port switch. And if you basically add up all the powers, if you go from two to 36, the power scales are about 7.4 watts compared to a commercial electronic switch with the same port count dissipates 85 watts. So you're a factor of 10x better just by doing a coupled electronic photonic sort of circuit, which is a big deal. I mean, a factor of 10x is not a small number. So how do we actually put all these things together? So I just didn't want to sort of talk about what only we do. I wanted to give you a broader sort of picture about what is currently being done by other people as well. So I'll talk about current approaches, I'll talk about heterogeneous integration, and then I'll give you a little bit about the future work. So for those of you who are not sort of process people, a front end of the line integration basically means you start doing your integration right at the transistor level, right? 
So the first thing that people, for, I mean, that became a commercial product was something that used front end of the line integration. So by front end of the line integration, I mean you start building things right where you start putting your CMOS transistors. This is a photograph from Luxteva, and this is their prototype 10 gigabits transceiver. And as you can see, it's a, it's a fairly complicated looking device. It has flip chip bonded lasers, it has optical filters, it has a complete 10 gig receive path with germanium photo detectors, it has full CMOS, and it also has silicon modulators. It has everything in it. Right. So how do they do it? Sure. So we'll talk about above IC as well. So I'll talk about that. So, okay. yeah. It's a good question. I'll talk about it. So for Luxterra's approach, they have silicon photonic circuits, which has wave waveguides, wave waveguide structures, vertical couplers, modulators, detectors, and your TIA. They added to a standard silicon fab. I mean, that's actually a picture of the Pentium 4. I know it so well because I worked on it. But <laughs> apparently they used it. God knows why. And they get their fully integrated part. Their claim is that it en enables low cost, and we will we'll talk about that when we when we get get to it. So here is their technology. So they basically have a silicon on insulator sort of structure, and they make their transistors on an active silicon island. So there's your poly gate. You do your Silicide block and your field oxide for your modulators, and you have your other devices. You have your germanium con germanium dope for your photo detector, and do it all at this sort of. They do all the doping at the same time, so that's the front end. So they don't actually, they don't have to. Their thermal budget is slightly different, because in order to do these devices and grow high quality things, you need to have pretty high temperatures. But once you start putting metallization down, you cannot get to those temperatures. So you want to be careful about how you do it. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of people prefer a front end line integration. One of the disadvantages of the approach is you actually are isolated from, the device is isolated from the heat removal system. So that can become an issue if you're not too careful. So here's what they've actually been able to do. They've been able to make modulators, integrated photodiodes, and they actually have a fiber coupler that comes in to couple into this grating to send the light in. And they also took a micropackaged laser, so they actually don't make the laser. The laser is one element they don't have, so they actually don't use three, five elements in their doping. So because they wanted to keep it CMOS friendly, supposedly, and therefore they basically get a micropackaged laser and this flip chip bonded, and that's how they get a light source into their system. So the the problem is that the development cost is very high. I mean, if you really want to do this, you have to get into the fab and actually put in the money to actually make it happen. It's not as low cost as, the, because the amount of money that you put in to make it happen is actually pretty high. The other big disadvantage is it doesn't necessarily leverage the, the pace at which the CMOS industry goes. So it currently has like a 22 nanometer transistor, and soon they want to make a 10 nanometer transistor. You're not actually going to leverage it if you have your own little fab trying to do CMOS and photonics together and you want very high speed electronics. It's not going to happen. So that's, that's another disadvantage of doing some sort of like front end of the line total integration uh, in one go. Here is the other big sort of approach that, that people have been trying to do. And this is out of Europe. This is called Helios, which stands for photonics. So they forgot the P. So it's photonics probably. It's photonics, electronics, functional integration on CMOS. So they basically evaluated three options. One is to do a combined front end fabrication, which is sort of what we talk, talked about. The other way to do it is do backside fabrication. So in that level, what you do is you basically have your integrated backside layer and you do what is called a through silicon via. You basically drill a hole all the way through your silicon and, and basically contact it down. And you have your last layer metallization. This, so this is what you were alluding to. What happens if you put it on top? So that's what we're going to talk about next. So this is called above IC photonic integration. So here what you have is you have your CMOS layer and everything in the bottom layer with the metallization. And then you have your photonics on top. And this is sort of the structures that they've made. They have made indium phosphide dyes bonded after last level metallization. 
They brought in silicon rib waveguides with like 90 degree mirrors to basically make on chip clock distributions. So, how do they do it? So, they first take a silicon wafer and basically, after the fourth metallization or about fifth metallization, they get it out of the fab and they do a planarization step and they cover it with oxide. Then, what they do is they go on and take a separate wafer, silicon wafer with an oxide, silicon on an insulator wafer, and basically make, start making their photonic structures. So, they first do their fiber coupling, they do their AWG and all that stuff. Then they actually have to go and do a doping for their modulator. They do a photo detector. So they again use germanium for their photo detector. Then they do their mirrors. And after which they take the whole structure and then bond it on top of the CMOS layer. After this step, they have to do a removal of the top silicon substrate so they can get access to the photonic layer. And then basically what they do is they because there are no active components in this, they actually bond a indium phosphide laser on top. Then they do the substrate removal for that. As you can see, this is a very tedious process. And then they basically planarize with silicon dioxide. They then make vias all the way to the CMOS layer and do a metallization. So this is not a very trivial sort of fabrication procedure. So what are the limitations? One of the limitations is that you have very five very sophisticated processing steps before you can actually do the integration. So that's going to be a big limitation. So every step, extra processing step you do in general is a yield hit if you're not careful. So if you want to keep your yields, you need to be uh, careful about how you do your integration. The other thing is if you want, you're going to go and ask a foundry to give you a way for a right out of the fourth level metallization, you better have a pretty good relationship with them. And not a lot of us do, right? So if you really want to do this at the university level or even at the company level and you're starting small, it's kind of hard to get like huge lot wafers from, from commercial foundries that give you like at the fourth level of metallization full wafers. So that, that's another cost reason that, that you have to be careful about. And this suffers from the same problem that even if you do that, that foundry may not be the best foundry to give you the best state of the art transistor. And then what do you do? You want to go to somebody else, then you'll have to ask them to they give you a, a different type of wafer, and that's going to be an issue. So here's Ash, who did the wafer scale approach. He's sitting, sitting right there. So, <clears throat> so what we want to do is do it slightly differently. So we understand that photonics and electronics do not work at the same length scale. Right? So why don't you just make a photonic circuit separately, make an electronic circuit separately, and then come and try to put them together on a common substrate? Could we actually do that? If we could do that, then we could actually take a completely different approach to this whole problem. The advantage of this is you basically leverage the best CMOS that is out there and, you base, and the best photonic te technology that you can get your hands on, and that's how you can do it. What is the disadvantage? Because in general, the way we do it is we do a, a 2D integration. You generally end up with a slightly larger package size. And you may have some issues with waveguides, but I, we have solutions for that that we're working on. So we'll talk about that as well. So what do we want to do? What do we want? What we want to do is we want to take CMOS foundry die that has been made by somebody. It can be IBM, it can be Intel, it can be anybody. Make fully integrated circuits. Then basically get your your hybrid 3.5 photonic silicon wafer, which has all your 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 photonic circuitry in it. Make slots for these chips. Drop them in, planarize them, connect them, and you're ready to go. Right? So this is sort of what we want to do. So as a proof of concept, we wanted to first figure out, can we actually do this? I mean, can we actually take a silicon die, put it in and planarize it and metallize it? So what we did was we first take our, the chip that comes from the foundry, and we make what is called a chip-specific hole. So we take the chip and make it look like the mask and basically expose resist. And now you have a pattern that's pretty similar to what your chip die was. And the reason we do this is because die soft streets differ from die to die. So you have to be careful about how you do it. So if you don't, if you just have a sort of square hole that is, you have to put some sort of guard band so that you can fit your, your chip in there. And that actually can lead to other issues because it doesn't get you the planarization that you want. So 
Right. So there, there are other ways to do is there are like self-aligned ways to actually keep them by using, uh, we're trying to use basically a, a, a surface tension driven approach to actually bring them all together. So there are, there, are, there are ways to do it in such a way that your alignment is within a few nanometers on a, on a multi-die on wafer. So you can also do a, a chip to wafer pick and place as well. So there are many ways to do this. So, so there are, this, these are things that we're actively looking at as well. So basically after, after we make this sort of pattern, what we do is we actually drill it all the way through with a Bosch etch to get a, uh, a, a hole through the, through the chip, I mean through the wafer. And then we basically put in our chip into this holder. So you can see that the gap is kind of very, very tiny. So we have only a six micron gap between what the hole we made and the chip that we have. That's the biggest one. In general, it's around two. So after which what we do is we take the whole thing and flip it upside down and put it on top of a support wafer. And the reason why we do it is what you really want to do is you want to keep these two at the same level. And the best way to do it is just use gravity and flip it and put some pressure and put it on a very flat substrate. That way they're all on the same sort of surface. After which we put spin BCB, which is, which is basically like, a, like an adhesive, and we onto another carrier wafer. And then we basically bond that to this, this, this composite mixture of chip and photonic wafer. So what will be a photonic wafer? What we did was just a silicon wafer. So after you do this, you just flip the whole thing and you remove your support wafer. You have a chip that is pretty much in plane with your, your wafer structure. In order to actually put and make all this into one unified piece, we use what, 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 what silica spin on glass, which is basically a silicon squoxane material, which cures under either, you can either use heat or you can use UV. Uh, and you basically do a spin twice and then you planarize and fill it. So this actually fills all the way, even if there's a very tiny crevice, it just goes in and fills it up. In fact, we've even done a process without this carrier wafer. And that's, that's sort of what we want to do for future waveguide integration. So here you see that it's completely filled with silicon, I mean, spin on glass. And here's your chip, and there's the gap. And that's the height of the spin on glass that you, you put on top. So after which, you basically s sort of do your next step, which is you make your patterns that you want to metalize from your contacts to your chip to your wherever you need to go. You do your, your sputter of Thai gold or whatever your favorite metal is and do your uh, patterning, and then you're done. And that's what you get. So, go ahead. That's actually not necessarily true because this only shown as a periphery, sorry. So this is only shown as a periphery connection, but you can also have a full array connection all the way on top of this die as well. And you can also do multi-level metallization if you wanted to. So you can, but, but the real thing is, I mean, this is, a con, this is actually a good question. One of the things is, if you look at a, a typical photonic circuit, the number of interconnects that you actually need to control it is not that much. It's actually not that much. So it's, it's usually the, the data bandwidth and things like that that require a lot of pins, which we don't have in this particular case. Right? So it's all optics. So that's actually how, how you get away with it. So this is sort of a fully integrated chip that has been fully planarized. I mean, we have a, we have a surface profile of about 200 nanometers. I mean, that's the kind of like planarization that we can get. So the lithography that we can do on this is, is very, very good. And we can get very, very good alignment with the, with the chip pads and with the metal. And so what we want to do after this point is to basically integrate this particular process with the, with the photonic switch so that we can actually make a full silicon optical interconnected electronically controlled switch. The next thing we're trying to work on is how do you actually have a separate waveguide layer along with this technology so that if you want to use other than silicon waveguides, if you want to use something like a nitrided waveguide or something like that, how do you actually make that happen? So we're also actively working on those kinds of things as well. So with that, I will sort of conclude my talk. The main message I wanted to give was there is plenty of power savings to be had. The only question is how do we get there? 
photonic interconnect according to me is sort of the driving and the key technology that would get us to that point we can actually achieve these kind of goals and without a close heterogeneous integration of CMOS and until photonic fabs become as reliable as CMOS fabs that you can just sort of design something on the computer and send it and get back a device exactly the way you want it, you definitely want to have very close integration of CMOS not only for control but for also to get rid of variations that you might have in the fab so that your device works the way you want it to work. I want to acknowledge Professor Bowers without whom I probably wouldn't have even gotten in this field and he actually taught me quite a bit. And people from Orion, uh, Greg Fish, Alex Fang and Eric Hall and without my graduate students who do all the work, I am just the sort of front man here. Louise and Ash who are here who did all the work that I presented today. And if you have any questions, we would be more than happy to answer them. Right, so we can actually, yes, so we can actually either do a die, like a diamond sort of layer or we can actually not also make holes in the BCB layer and fill it with a, with a thermal conductor. We have also looked into having thermal adhesives that have actually metal nanoparticles in them that actually dissipate the heat better. So we have been looking at that as well. No, 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 you're actually dropping the CMOS chip into the three for wafer. This, the silicon chip is only like a millimeter by millimeter. We're talking very, very tiny chip. Yes, it's a, no, it's a, it's a hybrid. It's basically a three five layer on top of a silicon wafer. It's a hybrid wafer, right? I mean, this is what Professor Bowers does. So the photonic wafer is actually an indium phosphide layer on top of a silicon, yeah. right? And that is the this is the CMOS chip, oh, okay. and that's the photonic. Oh, okay. Is that clear? Yeah. So if you take something like that eight by eight optical grid, the drivers for those six or switches are quite small. I don't know what. Yeah. But a millimeter by millimeter for a total of like 16 drivers. Or something. Way smaller than the optical chip. Okay. So you really then play this pocket in the middle of the computer like you would in the computer wave. Right. So that's the thing. The scale of photonics is so much different from CMOS that you can play a lot of these tricks. Okay. Right. So, so it's not overly processed, it's just a couple chips. You, no, it is. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. The only does it have an advantage in terms of utilization? It should. And the thing is what we need to figure out is that is do the characteristics of the silicon photonics remain exactly the same as they were before we started it. And that's the current experiment that we are trying to do. Right. Only then can I really comment on the yield. Right. They have actually done something and I actually have to integrate it in order to comment on it. I've only taken the first step, I need to take the next step. But, it, but from a theoretical standpoint of view, yes, it should definitely give you a higher yield. And that's why generally a convergent approach to design will always give you a higher yield. It's better to take two paths and come together at the end than to serialize the steps, right? which is what they do always. I mean, in general, this is why you never want to do a front end of the line integration for a very disruptive technology like photonics, because it uses very new types of processing that the CMOS people don't really like. They don't want to do it that way. But that's also changing because right now I think I think Intel actually announced that they're using a 3.5 gate for their new transistor. So for all you know, you might have a 3.5 layer without you asking for it. So right, I don't think so. Yeah. So the thing with the flip chip bonding is so usually you when you have a flip chip bond you generally have a the electrical characteristics of the bond is will actually affect your speed and your reflection and then you have to have right terminations you have all these other issues right you are talking about a ball that's about 200 microns right so you can use a sequence of wire bonds to 
it's not a wire bond. It's not a wire bond. It's an actual lithography step, right? It's, a, it's a, like a metallization on top of a, yeah. So if you look at this, maybe that was not very clear. This is actually the chip that has been slotted into a wafer. And then we pulled out all these wires. And these are all metallized, right? So we, we actually metallize it after we are done. And in fact, we tested the circuit after we did all this stuff to make sure that the chip actually worked the way we wanted it to work as well. So the thermal budget that we have in this particular process in such a way that it doesn't affect anything. So we actually verified that by looking at the threshold shifts in the transistor and things like that. So. So what kind of accuracy are you expecting with this uh, top metallization layer once you replace it? Alignment? Alignment. It's about, I think right now we're only limited by the alignment of our, of the EV6, so it's around half a micron, one micron, half a micron, something like that. So you're matching our accuracy? Yes, of course, yeah. So flip chip accuracy is also another, you'll have to, be, it's about plus minus five, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's what I'm saying. So you can actually, if you take the next step and actually do this sort of self-aligned self multi-chip, uh, this is the next thing that we're going to do, then you don't have that problem either. So that's the next problem that we're trying to solve. So go ahead. So no, because at the end of the day, the, 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 this chip is only like 200 microns thick. So when you actually slot it in and fill up with, fill it up with silicon on, with, with spin on glass, it actually makes a full flat connection. It makes the thickness variation go away on both sides. So when you actually, when you have a very thin die that you're slotting into a very big hole, let's say, right? You have this huge gap at the back, yes? Right? So, but when you actually do a spin on glass layer, it actually covers the whole hole and planarizes it. We've actually done this as well. No, 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 that, that's on the back side. I'm talking, that's why we flip it upside down, right? So if you, in this particular step, what we do is we flip the whole thing upside down. So the surface of this and the surface of this are completely flat. The only mismatch that you can have will be on that side, which we don't care about. That's why we did it this way. Because originally when we did it the other way, we were like, we just never matching. And we were like, what the hell? So we just flipped the whole thing, made it flat by using the fact that this is a very flat surface. And then we applied a, basically did a, did, took a bonder and basically made it bond. So that's basically what we did. That's how we get around that problem. I mean, we, we are talking about a variation, surface variation between here and here of 100 nanometers. That's the measured data that we have. Not right now. I mean, right now we're just trying to. I mean, we could. We, we this, the switch could be anything. Right? So, but the WDM is going to be at the transmitter side, right? So, the switch fabric itself is not the. Right. Sure, but maybe I'm not, let, let's, okay, let me, let me make sure that I can, I'm at the same page that you are because. So, so this. Yes, yes, okay. it's not a wavelength selective if switch, we no. we added that on that, this, this device right here, which we probably about to do this, this, yeah, this, this is bringing the whole, the whole. Integration makes, okay. Yes, but that's, at the same time, yes, it's not a wave, it's not like a self-routing wavelength based switch, yes. Right, exactly, but it's much faster. We're going to do it, don't worry. <laughs> don't get it loose way. Let's that's right. When I set my mind to something, it gets done. All, all my students pay for it. <laughs> one, one more question. 
this is being filmed. I should watch what I say. No, yeah, you do clock recovery from the data, so there is no separate. But then we do a lookup table based thing, right? So as soon as we get it, we just go into a lookup table and just spit out the data, right? So that's how we get around that problem. Otherwise, you have to do a per packet thing, which is not a good 